Hi, everyone. This is Joey Lindstrom over at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, thank you for joining us today for our new member orientation webinar. And uh, more broadly, hey, thank you for joining us as new members of the coalition. Um, most of you joining us today will be people who have joined in the last year. Those are the people who we really targeted with outreach for this uh, orientation webinar. But for those of you who have been part of our network for several years, um, you're quite welcome, uh, again, to, to be a part of this, and uh, we really appreciate having you. Uh, so today, um, we're going to go over what it means to be a part of NLIHC, uh, but before we start, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, the presentation slides and the recording of the presentation will be available on our website uh, starting tomorrow. You will also get an email with the recording and the slides. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to type them into the questions box. It should appear in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We ask that you uh, please use that box rather than the chat option. Uh, the questions box is just sort of easier to, uh, to read through. Um, we'll take a break and answer questions several times throughout the webinar, um, but let's get started. Uh, first, in the room here is, are all the members of NLIHC's field team. Um, I'm Joey Lindstrom, and you'll get a slide um, later on in the presentation where you can see all of our pretty faces. Um, you'll be hearing from um, four out of the five of us uh, during today's presentation, except for Brooke Shipwright, who's running our presentation today and controlling all the technology issues. So if any of you are having audio or visual problems, um, you can shoot an email to um, uh, bshipwright at nlihc.org, and it might pop up on our screen there, and she can... Uh, help you out. Uh, otherwise, I'm joined by Tori Beret and Kyle Arbuckle, housing advocacy organizers here at NLIHC, as well as uh, Elena Calabro, who is our field intern for this year and doing a spectacular job in helping us prepare today's uh, webinar and presentation. So, um, the first thing I'd like to do is just uh, do a quick audio check. Um, if all, if, if you're hearing me well, I'd love it if any of you could just sort of drop into the questions box, a quick um, hearing you fine or, or yes, uh, and then we can proceed with extraordinary confidence. Um, thank you for those of you who have contributed that. Cool. So um, getting started, here's the overview of what we're going to do today. Um, this webinar is designed to introduce you to NLIC's team, our work, and how you can get more involved. First, we'll discuss NLIHC's background to give you a sense of where we came from and where we are today. We'll review key terminology for NLIHC members that will be helpful to know as you join and participate in our advocacy efforts. We'll also provide a brief overview of the teams within NLIHC and discuss each team's primary focus and contributions to our overall mission. We'll chat about how you can be an effective advocate and provide you with the resources you need to be knowledgeable about the issues affecting the lowest income renters. And we'll discuss membership specifics before we finally um, leave plenty of time for Q&A. So our mission here at NLIHC uh, is dedicated, is that we are dedicated solely to achieving socially just public policy that ensures people with the lowest incomes in the United States have affordable, accessible, safe, and decent homes. Now, it's our mission that probably uh, drove many of you to join NLIHC, and we very much appreciate your support of that mission. There are a lot of national organizations working on housing, but what makes us unique is our focus solely on the lowest income people, because as we'll show in a moment, that's really what the data suggests we need to focus on. Our goals. Our goals at NLIHC are to preserve existing federally assisted homes and housing resources, to expand the supply, of low-income housing, and then to establish housing stability as the primary purpose of federal low-income housing policy. We believe strongly in our research, our learning, and what our partners validate for us. Um, we know what the problem is, we know what the shortage is, and we know what the solutions are. The proven programs that end and prevent homelessness among low-income people. All we lack is the political will to fund those solutions. So everything we do is around reaching that goal of funding the programs that can end housing poverty. A brief note about our history. In 1974, Cushing Dole Bear founded the Ad Hoc Low Income Housing Coalition in response to President Nixon's moratorium on federal housing programs. While this group focused on uh, federal advocacy, 
other members established the Low Income Housing Information Service, which some of you might be aware of. It was put together in 1975 to provide information on housing problems and federal programs, as well as technical assistance and support to state local housing advocacy efforts. If you've ever seen our state housing profiles or congressional district profiles, you'll know that breaking down data into manageable uh, pieces for advocates throughout the country remains a key focus of our work. This comes from the Low Income Housing Information Service. In 1978, the Ad Hoc Coalition was incorporated as the National Low Income Housing Coalition, NLIHC, an acronym that everyone believes just rolls off the tongue. The two organizations operated jointly with LIHIS, uh, focusing on information, public education, and technical assistance, and NLIHC having a focus on advocacy. Uh, in 1992, LIHIS launched a major initiative to strengthen partner housing coalitions at the state level in response to the devolution of many uh, federal programs. And when I say devolution, I mean the, uh, the trend in the 90s to take federal programs and give them more state and local control. Um, the maturation of NLIHC and LIHIS led to a decision in 96 to formally merge the two organizations into one membership organization governed by one board of directors. And NLIHC today continues um, all of the work of LIHIS, and that's the, uh, the wonder co wonderful coalition that you know um, and that you've joined. So um, one thing that I really want to establish uh, for this webinar and then also for conversations moving forward is that there are some key terms that we use a lot. We use them in our conversations. We use them in our publications. And it's helpful if everybody sort of knows how we use that vernacular. So several terms we frequently use. Um, the first is when we use the term lowest incomes, we're referring specifically to households that make 30% or less of area median income. Uh, AMI, uh, median income, as you know, is a value calculated by HUD for every region of the country. And it's used to determine income eligibility for federal programs. To be considered middle income, a household's income is 81% or more of the AMI. Low income means a household is between 51% and 80% of AMI. And then very low income means a household is between 31% and 50% of the AMI. Um, so um, extremely low income means living at or below 30% uh, uh, or below the federal um, poverty guidelines. Um, so you may be asking, what does it even mean for a home to be affordable? The, the term affordable is one that can get a little bit um, uh, mushy in the world of advocacy, but HUD's definition is the most common definition and certainly the one that we go with, right? So affordable to us and to um, most people who are using HUD programs is when a household is spending no more than 30% of their gross income on rent and utilities. When a household pays more than 30% of its income on rent and utilities, they are considered cost burdened. And when a household pays more than 50% of their income on rent and utilities, they are severely cost burdened. So when you hear the terms cost burden and severe cost burden, we're not just being descriptive. Those are technical terms that are, that are defined by HUD. Um, of course, as many of you know, it's the cost burdened and especially severely cost burdened households who are most likely to experience homelessness. Another useful term to know is fair market rent, which is a value calculated by HUD for every region. It is the estimate of the cost of a modest apartment in a given area, and it is used to determine payment standards for federal voucher programs. What we're going to do next is we're gonna start talking about NLIHC's team and who the people are who you'll likely be interacting with as NLIHC members. Um, I'll chat just a little bit about our admin and development teams, and then I'll turn it over to Tori to talk about our policy team and our policy engagement. We have an incredible team here at NLIHC. Everyone who works here is deeply committed to our mission and works hard to achieve it. Uh, Diane Yantel is our president and CEO. Uh, she's a veteran uh, housing policy expert with nearly two decades of work on affordable housing and community development. Um, Paul Keeley is our chief operating officer, leading the coalition's financial and human resources management, program planning, resource development, um, field and organizing and communication. Uh, Josephine Clark is our executive assistant uh, who works with Diane to coordinate um, various things that make her more effective, such as her schedule, scheduling um, and uh, putting together board meetings and overseeing those and other administrative duties. 
Uh, Catherine Reeves, who you'll see at the bottom the center of the screen, uh, is our development coordinator. Uh, she plans our annual leadership reception, uh, works with major donors raising money for the organization here, uh, does a lot of grant writing and grant reports, and supports a lot of the work leading up to the annual policy forum. Um, Cara Norris at the bottom right, uh, many of you know, uh, she's the person who's been at NLIC the longest. She's our director of administration, um, and she leads several projects to ensure things run smoothly at NLIC, uh, including IT, uh, human resources, accounting, office management, um, and really um, all the things that uh, keep the lights on and, and keep, the, uh, keep the trains running around here. So uh, you might interact with Diane or Paul uh, or Cara or Catherine um, when, when dealing with NLIHC's paperwork and bureaucracy and so forth, or whenever you need to uh, talk to folks who are involved in leadership. Um, but as it relates to policy, uh, we, do, we have our own uh, team of policy wonks, and I'm going to turn it over to Tori Beret to talk about them. Tori. Hey guys, this is Tori. Um, so, just going to introduce the policy team. So, first, our policy team tracks and analyzes key housing legislation and regulations, educates federal policymakers, and testifies before Congress to advocate for just housing policy. So, on our policy team, we have uh, Sarah Mickelson, who's the Senior Director of Public Policy at the coalition. Uh, she oversees the organization's broad congressional portfolio. Ed Gramlich is our senior advisor to the CEO. He leads NLIC efforts related to affordable housing regulations and is NLIC's expert on regulations related to the National Housing Trust Fund and affirmatively furthering fair housing um, as well as other HUD regulations. Uh, Noah Patton, Sonia Acosta, and Kim Johnson are housing policy analysts responsible for identifying and analyzing federal policy and regulatory activities related to our, poli our, to our policy priorities, and then advocating around those policies and activities on the Hill while also working with us, the field team, engage NIC's membership and network in field advocacy. Um, so I'm just going to briefly touch upon some of the policy priorities we're working on right now. Uh, the National Housing Trust Fund is one of them. It's the only federal housing program exclusively uh, aimed towards the development, preservation, operation, and rehabilitation of rental housing for extremely low-income households and those with the most acute housing needs. Uh, we played a critical role in the passing of the National Housing Trust Fund in 2008. This year, we're working with stakeholders to build congressional support to increase funding to the Housing Trust Fund. Uh, we're also working, as always, to protect the trust fund from any uh, threats to eliminate it. Uh, we also work on federal budget and spending. For the fiscal year 2020 budget, we're asking legislators to fund USDA and HUD programs at the highest levels possible. These programs have been chronically underfunded for years, and we need more resources at the federal level to meet the housing needs of the lowest income renters. Uh, we also focus on fair housing, uh, so we support the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing rule issued in 2015 that helps communities better meet their fair housing obligations and promote housing choice. Uh, we also will continue to work to counter the current administration's efforts to weaken fair housing policies. Uh, so we're also participating with fair housing and civil rights organizations in an effort to oppose HUD's proposed rule on disparate impact, which will make it easier for local governments to use federal funds in ways that perpetuate segregation. Uh, disaster housing recovery um, is another one of our focuses. We work to ensure that federal disaster recovery efforts reach all impacted households including the lowest income seniors, people with disabilities, families with children, veterans, people experiencing homelessness, and other at-risk populations who are often the hardest hit by disasters and have the fewest resources to recover afterwards. The coalition also works to advance a comprehensive set of recommendations for Congress, FEMA, and HUD. Uh, around housing and criminal justice, we work to address the barriers to housing that formerly incarcerated individuals often experience upon reentry. 
affordable housing resources are already scarce in low-income communities where formerly incarcerated individuals typically return. Because of their criminal records, these individuals face additional barriers to accessing affordable housing, which places them at increased risk of homelessness and subsequent recidivism. We believe that unless HUD and Congress reform screening policies and provide additional housing resources to reduce these barriers, efforts to reduce the U.S. prison population will likely result in an even greater unmet demand for housing. Um, around Native American housing, uh, Native Americans in tribal areas face some of the most severe housing needs in the United States, including high poverty rates and low incomes, overcrowding, a lack of plumbing and heat, and unique development issues. Federal investments in affordable housing on tribal lands have been chronically underfunded for decades, and the recent changes to federal native housing programs have led to an even greater reduction in resources. This year, we're working with tribal leaders and advocates to increase housing resources for tribal nations with the greatest needs, improve data collection on tribal housing, and reduce federal barriers to housing development. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of priorities. We're also dealing uh, and prioritizing rural housing currently. Rural communities face unique affordable housing challenges, including higher and more persistent levels of poverty, lower incomes, and less incentives for private investment due to higher construction costs. Despite the growing needs, federal investment in affordable housing in rural America has been underfunded for decades. We work with our state and national partners to advocate for increased funding for USDA and HUD programs that, in that can increase access to safe, decent, accessible, and affordable housing in rural America. Uh, and lastly, around housing-related tax credits, we support efforts to expand and reform the low-income housing tax credit to better target extremely low-income families we're also working on the creation of a deeply targeted renter's tax credit to make housing affordable for the lowest income people, notably through legislation like the Rent Relief Act. So uh, our policy team, part of what they do is also provide education on the policies that we're supporting uh, and opposed to. So we publish that periodic reports, articles, and other useful resources to educate policymakers, our state partners, and our members about the need for more affordable homes. The examples on the slide are just some of many of the fact sheets we have available online. You can go to the Explore Issues section of the website to find fact sheets for most of the topics listed. So I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the National Housing Trust Fund is one of MLIHC's key priorities. Um, and we have a Housing Trust Fund Implementation and Policy Group, which is a coalition of national advocates committed to protecting and expanding the Housing Trust Fund. We collaborate with stakeholders to build congressional support to increase funding for the Housing Trust Fund through housing finance reform, tax reform, investments in infrastructure, and other legislative avenues. You can find out more about the first three years of housing trust fund allocation in a report getting started um, available online under the housing trust fund uh, section. And more detailed information on the housing trust fund and funding sources and how it can be used are all found at www.nhps.org. So a little bit more about the Disaster Recovery Coalition. As I mentioned earlier, uh, MLIC leads the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition, comprised of more than 800 national, state, and local organizations, including many who work directly with disaster-impacted communities. The coalition works to ensure that federal disaster recovery efforts reach everyone impacted by disaster, including at-risk populations who are often the hardest hit by disaster and have the fewest re resources to recover afterwards. You can stay informed on disaster housing recovery policies by reading updates in the weekly memo to members and checking the disaster housing recovery policy page on our website. So Opportunity Starts at Home is uh, one of our newest efforts. Uh, it's our national multi-sector campaign that aims to meet the housing needs of the nation's low-income people by 
uh, getting multiple sectors together uh, to advocate for housing needs. Mike Kaprowski is the National Campaign Director of Opportunity Starts at Home, and Chantal Wilkinson is the Housing Campaign Coordinator. Uh, so the campaign is advised by a steering committee, including leading national organizations representing a wide range of sectors that are working shoulder to shoulder to solve the housing affordability crisis. Steering committee members provide ongoing strategic and tactical guidance to the campaign, assist with developing sector-specific content, mobilize their respective networks around certain policy actions, participate in campaign events, engage state local affiliates about campaign matters, and encourage other organizations in their sector to participate in the campaign. Um, so there are four major goals that the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign has um, related to advancing federal housing solutions. Uh, the federal housing solutions they're working to advance uh, will bridge the growing gap between renter income and rising housing costs will provide aid to people experiencing job losses or other economic shocks to avert housing instability or homelessness, will expand affordable housing stock for low-income renters, and will defend existing rental assistance and other targeted housing resources from harmful cuts. Thanks, Tori. That was a lot of great info. Um, before I turn it over to Elena to introduce some of our research publications, I thought this would be a good time to ask if anyone has questions based on all the policy things uh, that Tori just discussed. Um, so just a brief pause and any questions in the questions box so far, Brooke? Yeah, so we have a question here um, asking, have any of the presidential candidates on both parties, are we getting into our home for vote? Possibly? Yeah, yeah, so that question okay. is in fact, skipping ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, we will be doing some our homes, our votes uh, conversation a little bit further on. Okay, uh, so I will there? save that one for later, Sylvia. Um, we have another one asking if there is consideration for uh, a tax cap for homeowners who have fallen into or are in the low income bracket. Oh, um, so that's something that we didn't get into in our policy conversation because it's not the sort of thing that we would take the lead on. Um, so we work specifically on the lowest income people, so extremely low income people. And as a result of that, um, the, the people in this income gra bracket are very rarely um, homeowners, right? Um, sometimes they might be people who are senior citizens and aging homeowners and so forth. Um, so affordable home ownership is extremely important and it's an extremely important part of um, a policy uh, portfolio that ensures affordability for everyone. There are other organizations that we work in um, coalition with who really focus and lead on those issues. Um, Prosperity Now, is a great example of one such organization. And so the specific question you have about um, limiting taxes um, on property taxes on people to become low income is something that I know a lot of uh, local governments have explored and state governments have explored. Uh, there's nothing that I'm aware of at the federal level because of course um, the federal level doesn't really do property taxes, rather they do um, certain ways that they encourage people to invest in property through tax deduction. Right. Uh, so we have focused on um, the mortgage interest deduction very recently before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or uh, President Trump, Trump's tax reform bill passed. Uh, that's something that we're likely to explore again uh, moving forward into the future. We have a question regarding Opportunity Starts at Home. Um, how can we encourage more disability organizations to participate in uh, this initiative? I think that's really wonderful. And, and frankly, the um, the world of disability advocates is one of the most important parts of our network and uh, our board of directors. And that's something that's always at the focus of what we do because um, someone earning a disability income is usually going to be around you know, 17 to 18% of area median income. And so very often people with disabilities are at the heart of our work working on um, issues with, uh, for people with extremely low income. Um, in terms of being more involved, um, I think organizations uh, should reach out to any of us on the field team directly or reach out to Mike or Chantel who were on the previous slide and who work more directly on the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign. Um, I know that Opportunity Starts at Home is often looking to add new organizations and new voices to their roundtable and, um, and always looking for 
um, experts on certain types of issues so that we can help to build out our talking points and fact sheets even further. Mm -hmm. uh, what is being done to weigh the impacts of the Moving to Work programs on people with disabilities? Um, a follow-up to that is that Moving to Work programs under HUD don't track impacts effectively. So I, I think that's a great question, and I think it's a question that, that also comes with a comment there. Uh, for those of you on the webinar who aren't familiar, uh, Moving to Work is a HUD um, sort of demonstration program where a, a smaller number of public housing agencies throughout the country get more quote-unquote flexibility in how they run their programs. And I, I do that as a quote-unquote because sometimes this flexibility is used for really wonderful things. Other times it can be used for things like time limits or work requirements or um, building up unnecessary reserves rather than issuing vouchers. And there are definitely some really concerning things that are happening with MTW. And one of the bigger concerns that uh, the person who asked this question uh, alluded to is we don't really have a lot of good information and a lot of good reporting about MTW. It is something that um, we're concerned about, we have opposed, and we have opposed the expansion of MTW. Um, and without spending much more time on it for this webinar, uh, I'll say, um, Tori showed you earlier a gentleman named Ed Gramlich, who's a senior advisor here. Um, and when it comes to uh, tracking some HUD programs and regs, uh, he's really the nerd we rely on uh, to get us that information. Um, and so further conversation with Ed, I think, would illuminate this issue. Um, but I think this is exactly the kind of issue that um, really shows the benefit of being an NLIHC member, because this is where you would go uh, to get some more information and to dig deeper on that issue. Great. Seeing no more questions, let's move forward with research. All right. So for research, I'm going to turn it over to Elena. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, so our research team analyzes data, identifies trends across the country, and then helps paint the picture of what our country's housing needs are. We're committed to data-driven advocacy and hope that our research strengthens the advocacy work you do at the local, state, or national level. So we'll walk through some of our research reports and how you can use this data to be a better advocate. Um, but before diving in, I just want to introduce our fantastic research team. Andrew Oren serves as our Vice President of Research, leading our research team. With him is Dan Emanuel, a Senior Research Analyst, and Daniel Street, a Research Analyst. So, Out of Reach is our annual report that comes out each spring and looks at just how out of reach housing is for low-wage workers. This map shows what the housing wage is in each state. The housing wage is what an individual working 40 hours per week needs to earn in order to afford a modest rental home at HUD's fair market rent without spending more than 30% of their gross income on housing costs. The average housing wage in the U.S. is $18.65 for a one-bedroom apartment and $22.96 for a two-bedroom apartment. This report also looks at how many hours a minimum wage earner needs to work in order to afford a one- or two-bedroom apartment at fair market rent. A renter earning the federal minimal, minimum wage would need to work 127 hours per week to afford a two-bedroom rental home at the fair market rent, and 103 hours per week to afford a one-bedroom. In no state can a person working full-time at the federal minimum wage afford a two-bedroom apartment at the fair market rent, and in only 28 counties can a full-time worker earning the minimum wage afford a one-bedroom rental home at the fair market rent. So these are our state housing profiles. Here's an example of how we take that data and make it more usable by breaking it down state by state. We hope that you find this information a helpful tool for educating your community about the housing crisis and use this in your advocacy efforts. Um, so the GAP is another one of our annual reports and it basically serves as our core argument for why we need to create more affordable housing for people with the lowest income. This report examines the gap between the number of extremely low income renter households and the number of rental units that are affordable and available to them. It also looks at housing cost burdens by income groupings in every state and the largest 50 metro areas. So this report identifies the problem, explains why the private market isn't working to address the shortage, and paints the picture for why we need public solutions. As mentioned, the GAP examines the number of homes affordable and available 
to extremely low-income households in the U.S. and in every state. Our most recent statistics show that while there are 11.2 million extremely low-income families in America, there are only 3.5 million homes available and affordable to them, which leaves an absolute shortage of 7.2 million homes for extremely low-income households. This shortage translates to both cost burdens for households at all incomes, as well as homelessness among the lowest income people. Because of these shortages, a housing mismatch is created, uh, where extremely low income households are often forced to live in housing not affordable to them, which creates shortages of units for households further up the income ladder who would be able to afford those units. Additionally, the increased presence of homelessness over the past few decades can also be attributed to the shortage. Prior to the 1970s, homelessness in America was rare because there was enough rental homes to meet the needs of lowest income households. As investment in low-income housing has decreased over time, homelessness has grown much more prevalent in every part of the nation. So ultimately, without increased investments in housing, there will continue to be a housing shortage for the lowest income households. This shows that in the US, there are only 37 affordable and available homes for every 100 extremely low income renter households, showing that the lowest income renters have the greatest need for affordable housing, but the least amount of homes available to them. And this chart answers the question, who are extremely low income renters? This is incredibly important information used to counter the myths and stereotypes about low income renters that are frequently used in arguments to slash funding for housing programs. I'm sure you've heard these types of arguments before. Why can't people just get a job to get themselves out of this predicament? The truth is that, the truth is that most people who can work do. The data shows that the vast majority of extremely low income renters already work in low wage jobs or they are unable to work. Nationwide, 39% of extremely low income households are in the labor force. 22% have a disability, and 26% are seniors. These statistics are important tools for fighting the Trump administration's proposals for ineffective work requirements, higher rent, benefit cuts, and other rent reforms meant to encourage work among low-income recipients of housing assistance. This chart also shows that 15% of extremely low-income renters are single adult caregivers of a young child or of a household member with a disability and 53% of these caregivers also participate in the labor market. These individuals can't rely on their work hours to afford their homes, which demonstrates the critical need for housing assistance and an increase in their hourly wage. This chart displays the income groups most cost burdened by their housing. And just like the previous chart showed, extremely low income households are bearing the brunt of the crisis. In addition to these two annual reports, NLIHC releases periodic research reports. Balancing Priorities examines the preservation challenges associated with the first wave of LIHC units that will reach the end of all federally mandated rent affordability and income restrictions. It explores the neighborhood characteristics of these units and discusses how scarce affordable housing resources create a dilemma between prioritizing uh, preserving affordable housing and promoting mobility for low income families to higher opportunity neighborhoods. The Housing Spotlight, The Long Wait for a Home, is a report we released in 2016 about housing choice vouchers and public housing waiting lists. Extremely low income households whose incomes are at or below 30% of the area median income accounted for 74% of households on the average HCV that's housing choice vouchers, waiting list, and 67% of households on the average public housing waiting list. These findings make clear that we must expand housing resources for our nation's lowest income renters. This is Joey. Uh, I just want to jump in really quickly before we talk about communication. Um, Elena talked about a lot of uh, research reports that we do and a lot of data projects and there were pie charts and there were graphics and so forth. I really want to emphasize that so much of the data that we do can be broken down to the state and local level. Um, and with things like out of reach, sometimes even into the zip code level, um, there are some numbers that we only have nationally. But for most of these things, if you're looking to express them for your state or your community, um, very likely we already have that online or it's something that we could get to you if you just reach out to us with a request. 
Back to Elena, sorry. Oh, yep. Um, so moving on to our communications team. Um, our team plays an essential role here by shaping the public dialogue around housing for the lowest income people. Renee Willis is the Vice President for Field and Communications. In this role, Renee leads all of our field and communications efforts in support of our mission, goals, and objectives. She is joined by Lisa Marlowe, our Media and Communications Coordinator, who is responsible for our external communications and media outreach. Ikra Rafi, our Creative Services Coordinator, is responsible for all of NLAHC's print and online graphic design efforts. Mia Wilson, our communication specialist, is responsible for supporting our nonpartisan voter and candidate engagement project, which is called Our Homes, Our Votes 2020. In addition to working on this project, Mia assists with other communications efforts, such as compiling and publishing our weekly e-newsletter, Memo to Members and Partners, and assisting with media outreach, response, and tracking. Our communications team helps share our message and raise awareness of low-income housing issues by publishing our weekly memo to members, engaging with our members and the media, doing all of our graphic design work to make our reports and website not only presentable, but enjoyable to look at, and managing our email communications and website. We would not be able to share our policy, field, and research work without our amazing communications. So we're going to turn it over to Field in just a second, but I do really want to emphasize, uh, as we talk about communications team, uh, if you're not following NLIHC on Twitter and Facebook, you're really missing out. We put out a lot of tweets, and that's a great way to keep in touch with um, what's happening moment by moment uh, on federal policy related to housing. Um, but let's talk about the Field team, which is, of course, uh, everyone in this room would agree, the most important team. Um, so Kyle Arbuckle, take it away. Thanks, Joey. Um, so I just wanted to take a quick minute to remind all of you that if you have any questions about policy or our research data, you can always reach out to us for further information. Uh, we can provide you with any resources you need, whether it's about federal policy, data about cost burdens, and affordability, and so on. Um, the field team serves as a liaison between NLIHC, our members, and our advocates throughout the country. We want to make sure you have the information and connections to be effective advocates. Um, so on this slide, you'll see our field team uh, as Mentioned before, Renee is VP for Field and Communications, and Joey, who you heard earlier, is the manager for the field team, and myself, Kyle Arbuckle, and Tori Beret, and Brooke Shipwright. Um, on the next slide, you'll see the map of uh, our territories, and um, this ensures that when you need to reach out and get in touch with us, you have a point of contact that knows you and your area. The field team participates in a variety of community outreach activities. You'll see us making presentations at statewide conferences and local events or staffing information tables to share NLIHC fact sheets and publications. We also manage several of NLIHC's campaigns, publish our quarterly Tenant Talk magazine, create and share CTAs, and maintain strong relationships with our state partners and members that are essential to our work at NLIHC. The field team's primary focus is to provide you with the resources to be an effective housing advocate. What do we mean when we talk about advocating for something? Advocacy is the term that we use to describe educational activities and organizing aimed at supporting a particular goal or outcome. Usually what it means in practice is to educate both the general public and political leaders. The reason we advocate is to push for the changes we want to see in our communities. And it's important to recognize that we're all experts on the ways which the status quo conditions of low income housing and of society more broadly harm our communities and it's our duty to advocate for better uh, conditions. Additionally, as experts, on as experts on community needs, our voices carry weight with the public and with elected officials. As we all know, the primary job of elected officials is to represent the sentiments of the community through legislative action. And if large groups of their constituents are contacting them about a particular issue, they take notice. Finally, it works. Think about all of the recent talk about new big housing bills or Medicare for all. These major shifts in opinion wouldn't have been possible without advocates pushing for them. And when we talk to staffers and legislators, we hear over and over that advocacy is important. So as I alluded to a moment ago, your views and priorities play a big role in a politician's policy choices and votes. This is not only because of your expertise as constituents, it is your ability to vote them in or out of office. It means that your views play a central role in either reinforcing or shifting their thinking on issues. Listed here are a few activities that are considered to be part of the advocate's playbook. Advocacy doesn't need to be a full-time responsibility and we try to make it easy for you as often as we can. Sometimes it can mean a more involved activity 
such as a lobby day in DC. More often it's easier than that. Signing your organization onto a CTA, sending an email with text that we drafted for you. So Kyle just used a term um, on the last slide that some of you might not know. Uh, we call it a CTA sometimes. This is a call to action. And many of you uh, have received our calls to action before. You've probably seen them from other advocacy groups. But calls to action are really important opportunities for you to use your voice, right? Uh, generally, this is a communication that we send out to our general field of advocates that reflects a view on specific legislation or specific action we're hoping people will take uh, in contacting their legislative representatives. Uh, but the CTA, the call to action, by the time you get it, is a whole process. And um, let's break that down a little bit and make it a little bit more tangible, right? Um, so let's look at how do I respond to a CTA. Um, first, uh, there, a CTA always has specific instructions on what you can do and how to do it. These instructions are, are usually mentioned at the top and probably also at the bottom of the CTA. You'll be asked to contact your legislator by phone or email, and some talking points will be included. Um, you'll be asked to um, personalize, or, or you'll be um, asked for some uh, personalized contact uh, targeted to an appropriate staff person, a specific person um, in a member of Congress's office. Or sometimes what we do is we ask organizations to sign on to a letter to endorse a policy proposal. And that way we have a lot of organizations um, behind the same ask, and that gives it a lot more weight, a lot more power. So let's talk about some ways to engage in advocacy. So here's a brief overview of how a bill becomes a law. Um, that might be basic for some of you, but it's important and I'll get through it quickly. Um, so for a bill to become a law, it first must be introduced which can only be done by a member of Congress. This, the idea for the bill can come from the member themselves, it can come from the president, it can come from individual citizens, organizations, or companies. The president may put forth a plan, but it's always a member of Congress that submits the actual bill. Um, during this stage when the idea for the bill is raised, advocates can attend Hill meetings in an attempt to influence the early stages of drafting. So this is something that we're very often involved in. Um, we don't want a bill to get introduced and then we're realize that it's not quite what we want. Um, we're always very engaged with um, congressional staff, staffers to make sure that legislation that's introduced reflects our priorities. Um, after that stage, a member of Congress will take the bill idea and introduce it into the House or the Senate. And at that point, it receives a bill number and it's posted on congress.gov. That's where you can start to track legislation. Um, if you want to follow a bill's progress, you can track them there uh, to congress.gov, which can also be uh, thomas.gov. Some of you might know it as that. Um, while the bill is drafted, NLIC analyzes the draft, formulates a public position, and notifies our state partners and sometimes also our broader membership about the bill. Um, once the bill has been introduced, the next thing that happens is it goes to committee. Uh, both the House and the Senate have committees on a range of topics. The committees that NLIC pays the most attention to are uh, committees on appropriations, budget, veterans affairs, transportation, and infrastructure. Uh, there are also a few committees that have different names in the Senate and the House but do similar things. We care a lot about the Senate Banking Committee, which is also the House Financial Services Committee, uh, because they have jurisdiction over issues pertaining to the economy, the banking system, housing, insurance, and finance. The House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee are both tax writing committees, and we follow them uh, closely for things like the renter's tax credit or mortgage interest deduction reform. Uh, during committee stages, NLIHC really targets committee members and does targeted calls to action to particular states or districts, encouraging members like yourself uh, to sign on to letters and to communicate with your members of Congress if they're on the key committee. So if you live in a district where your member of Congress is chair of a key committee, uh, you're the kind of person who's going to hear from us quite a lot. Um, in committee, the bill is editing, edited, and this is also known as marking up. If you ever hear that a bill is marked up, that just means it was edited and amended considerably in committee. The committee decides if it will go to the floor of the House or Senate to be voted on, or if it will stay in committee. Most bills remain in committee and never go, go to the floor. Um, this is how some bills are killed. Another way bills are killed is when they are passed by committee, but the House or Senate leadership never schedules them for a vote. Um, this is a really uh, easy way for leadership in either body of Congress to uh, be a roadblock as things are moving. 
If a bill does leave committee with approval of the majority of the committee members, it goes to the floor for a vote. And once passed out of committee, advocates participate in ongoing outreach and calls to action. Um, the floor means the entire House of Representatives or the entire Senate, not just the committee. When a bill gets to the floor, members of Congress can speak for or against the proposed bill. In the House, the Speaker of the House can determine how long a bill will be debated. And when the debate is over, whether to move forward with the vote. In the Senate, members can take over a debate on the Senate floor in order to prevent a vote on the bill. You've probably heard of this as filibustering. The Senate can end a debate with a vote passed by 60 members. This is called a cloture vote. It's a vote to stop the debate and move toward a vote. This is another critical opportunity for advocates to influence the legislative process by visiting Hill offices, receiving feedback from members of Congress, and then getting information to us at NLIHC so that we can rework our calls to action um, and the information that we're trying to get people to take to members of Congress. When a bill is ready to be voted on, a simple majority is needed in order to pass through each chamber. During this time, advocates continue outreach to field and Hill offices and ongoing call to action efforts. Once the bill passes in each chamber, something called the conference committee made up of House and Senate members meets to work through any differences there might be between the two versions of the bill. The conference bill then goes back to both chambers where it gets voted on again. And if it passes, it goes to the president. The president has one or two options, signing the bill or vetoing the bill. If the president do does decide to veto a bill, Congress needs a two thirds majority in both the House and the Senate to override a president's veto. So I hope everybody enjoyed uh, that little episode of Schoolhouse Rock <laughs> and um, talking about uh, how a bill becomes a law. But what I really would like to emphasize in all of that is there are numerous points in this process um, for you to use your voice in an influential way. And I can tell you probably the, the happiest thing I've learned since I moved to DC to do this job seven years ago is that members of Congress really do care about you and hearing from you. Um, we can have the best uh, policy experts uh, in, in the country and we do, and we can have the best researchers with the best data and we have that too, but they don't care about hearing from us, they care about hearing from their constituents. So um, you don't have to be an expert, but it's important that you participate in advocacy uh, because your members of Congress really rely on what you want to, um, what you want for your community. So um, I want to call a specific action to your attention. It's Our Homes, Our Voices, National Housing Week of Action. We've done it now for three years, and this is advocacy around the need for more federal resources um, for housing, specifically around the federal budget, uh, which is why we often do Week of Action in the spring. And you'll see a couple of pictures and examples here of local organizations um, conducting activities to uh, bring some, some attention to um, the, need for, the need for funding housing programs and um, also some attention to their effectiveness. Uh, this last year, we had um, over 120 events in 34 states, plus DC and, the Puerto, Rico, and, and Puerto Rico. Um, we had mayors, members of Congress, state and local legislators, participate in various uh, events, including rallies, letter writing campaigns, film screenings, um, congressional site visits to affordable housing. Um, it was a really great uh, week of action, and we thank everyone who was involved. We hope you'll think about doing a week of action event in your neighborhood or community for 2020. Um, speaking of 2020, hey, it's an election year. Um, and that's why we also have, um, have rebranded our electoral efforts as Our Homes, Our Vote because housing is built with ballots. Uh, we know that renters, especially low-income renters, are underrepresented among voters. It's critical for advocates to engage these renters and other low-income people in the voting process to ensure that their housing interests are represented. To achieve this, NLIHC created Our Homes, Our Votes 2020, a nonpartisan campaign to register, educate, and mobilize more low-income renters and affordable housing advocates. We're also working to elevate the conversation of affordable housing in the 2020 presidential election by encouraging candidates to create affordable housing plans. We've had a lot of success doing that, um, more so than any other uh, previous presidential primary. I think we're up to 13 candidates now with uh, presidential platforms, or, or excuse me, with uh, platforms on housing. And if you go to ourhomes-rvotes.org, you can see um, particular pages for every candidate uh, for president and see what they've been saying about affordable homes. 
to help members carry out effective voter engagement efforts, we provide a complete toolkit online. These resources include um, a voter engagement guide and plan covering topics such as voter education, registration, and mobilization. We're also having um, an, I, an Our Homes, Our Votes podcast and webinar series, which we're calling Third Thursdays at 3. Um, we do the third Thursday of every month, and we're going to be doing it until November of 2020, which means, yes, even one after the election for those who just can't let it go. Um, <laughs> So these, uh, these webinars will always feature advocates and experts with frontline experience in election efforts and uh, lots of opportunities for you to ask questions. Um, so please visit ourhomes-rvotes.org and take a look at the resources there and the upcoming webinar series. Um, so advocacy resources. We've already hit on a bunch of these and now I'm going to do just a quick walk through them and what they are. Um, first, know about the Advocates Guide. Um, this is an incredibly useful tool because it contains uh, everything that, uh, that we know, basically, about federal housing programs and everything that you need to know uh, about low-income housing and advocacy. Uh, it's a really great tool because for any given issue, whether it's housing opportunities for people with AIDS or project-based rental assistance, there's a three or four page article, and then when you're done, there's always a paragraph that says where to go for more information. Um, it's a really helpful tool. Uh, many of you received one when you became a new member. Uh, if you didn't receive one, we'll be happy to send one out to you right away. Uh, otherwise, you can access it online. Additionally, um, you can find our housing profiles. Uh, we've got state housing profiles, congressional housing profi profiles. Uh, there's even a preservation database uh, fact sheet that you can bring up about housing preservation in your community and how many affordable homes your community might be losing in the coming years if there isn't significant preservation activity. Uh, the congressional district profiles I wanna call out specifically because very often when you meet with your member of Congress, they might say, well, this is a you know Detroit problem. Well, us here in Kalamazoo don't have these issues, right? But the congressional district profile really breaks it down by the district, right? Um, and then, we have additional advocacy resources. Um, we have the National uh, Housing Preservation Database, which was created by NYHC and the Public and Affordable Housing Research Corporation way back in 2011. And the Preservation Database is an address level inventory of all the federal housing, federally assisted rental housing in the United States. You can go um, for any particular community and bring up little dots that will show you where those assisted properties are. You can also bring up a list of supported properties in your community. Um, and I'll tell you, because I don't think this is actually on your screen right now, that you can find the preservation database at www.preservationdatabase.org. And this is specifically for uh, properties that are subsidized and their affordability is set to expire within five years and what advocates need to do to preserve that affordability. Um, so now let's talk about tenant talk. Um, Tenant Talk is a quarterly publication specifically designed to engage residents, resident councils, and organizations that work closely on the ground in the grassroots way with low-income renters. We cover topics that are especially important to low-income residents, including relevant policy updates, local organizing victories that they might take to their community, um, perspectives from residents themselves. Um, and the most recent, uh, the most recent editions of Tenant Talk have focused on things like gentrification, public housing, fair housing, and involvement in elections. Um, you can find PDFs of Tenant Talk online, or you can sign up to have it mailed to you for free. Um, and that's just at the on the Tenant Talk page of our website. Um, other than that, uh, here's a list of our various resources and where they exist on our website. You can usually find them pretty quickly on the site or by getting in touch with any of uh, your lovely housing advocacy organizers and asking them uh, where to find a particular resource. Uh, just some really quick membership specifics. Know that you are not alone. Here's a map that shows we have NLIHC members in every state of this blessed union. Um, and for be continuing to be a member moving forward, uh, know that your membership expires one year uh, after when you join, and it always expires at the end of the month. Your membership contribution rates are only suggested amounts. Right, So you can always renew at any amount, and we certainly hope that you will. Revenue is an important part of membership, but really we just want to be able to say we have a strong membership, and we hope that you'll be uh, a part of our membership moving forward. You will get membership reminder emails, and we'll usually send you a letter in the months that you're expiring um, to remind you, uh, and then hopefully 
uh, convince you to stay on, uh, in the fold. Um, and then finally, just two quick announcements. Number one, our policy forum is coming up in March of next year. This is our annual conference where we talk about what's happening in Congress and how people can be involved. And the final day, of course, is a lobby day where we go to Capitol Hill and we meet with members of Congress and, uh, and their staff and we share about our priorities. And then membership is really important, though I don't need to tell any of you, you're already members. Because members, of course, were the only people invited to this webinar. Um, but please spread the word and help us get more members. So I think we've gone a little bit long. I think we're probably right at the hour mark, or just barely under it. Um, for those of you who have the patience, um, I think we should do some more questions. You all asked great questions earlier, and I think we should take the time um, to explore more of what you're wondering about. Brooke, what do we got? Um, so I just wanted to go back to Sylvia's question earlier about the presidential candidate. Um, I don't know that we fully touched on this, um, but have any of the presidential candidates on both parties worked with NLHC to develop their positions on housing needs? If they have, can you name them? Yeah, um, I can name, I can definitely name a few uh, that I'm aware of. And, and I should say, NLHC will work with any candidates who reach out to us. We do conduct our um, election work in a nonpartisan manner. Uh, and so regardless of what party you're with, if you reach out to us for some information and some guidance on housing policy, uh, we're happy to provide that uh, to you. Um, I know that uh, within this year, there are several candidates who we've worked with extensively as they've developed their platforms, but, but maybe in a less direct campaign context because we worked with them as they were developing legislation that they've introduced in Congress. So this would apply to Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Cory Booker, Senator Kamala Harris, Senator Michael Bennett, um, all of whom we worked with extensively. Uh, some of you might have seen Representative Beto O'Rourke, former Representative Beto O'Rourke, um, announced his housing plan uh, just in the last couple of days. And um, our president and CEO, Diane Yantel, participated in some events with him leading up to that announcement um, and helped to inform that process. Um, we've also, uh, both in this election cycle and the previous one, uh, been involved with uh, policy staff at Senator Bernie Sanders' campaign um, to give them the best information on um, housing policy solutions. And so we've been very proud of that. Um, we've had a lot of interaction with former Secretary Julio Castro. Uh, we had a great relationship with him when he was Secretary of HUD. Um, and now he's been participating in a lot of the Our Homes, Our Votes events that we've been putting together in New Hampshire and in Iowa. Um, so he's been uh, very, very in touch with us. Um, we've also had um, maybe more limited uh, work done uh, in, co in conjunction with uh, Senator uh, Amy Klobuchar and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand as well. Um, and those are the big ones off the top of my head. Um, I should say that Representative John Delaney uh, really talked a lot about um, the National Housing Trust Fund as a part of fi housing finance reform. And we've been working with, we've worked with his um, congressional staff back when he was in Congress in developing some of that proposal as well. Uh, does anybody, does it occur to anyone that I'm missing? Any big ones that we've talked about? I think, I think that's about everybody that we've worked with directly. And I will say there are a lot of other campaigns um, that we've worked with kind of indirectly, right? Um, we have sent, to each campaign a document saying, these are the solutions you should focus on as you talk about solutions to the housing problem. Um, and in other cases, um, candidates have been in touch, not necessarily with us, but maybe with our state partners or our local partners or other people who use our materials. So an example of that is um, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington, who I believe has left the race at this point. Um, he at one point released um, a housing component to his climate plan that included major investments in the National Housing Trust Fund. And I don't believe he worked with us directly to, to get that information, but I do uh, think he was in touch with the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, who he knows very well from his time um, having been governor of Washington. Um, so there are some campaigns that we influence uh, indirectly, even if we haven't been working with them in a very active way. Did you mention Mayor Pete Buttigieg in that? And if not, has he been involved, has talked about housing? Yeah, so um, Mayor Pete Buttigieg has talked broadly about housing in positive ways and, and making sure that we solve the affordable housing sort of problem and crisis. We've been told at certain points that there was an affordable housing plan forthcoming. We haven't seen that yet. 
Um, and so uh, there hasn't been a lot of um, active connection with that campaign. Um, we're hopeful that there will be more uh, in the future, but, but so far it's been less detailed than what we've gotten from other campaigns. Uh, one question was, what was the affordable housing database by area that you mentioned uh, um, just before the preservation database? So I believe um, Valerie is talking about the housing profile. Yeah. So there, there are basically four key places to get area-specific data. One is, I think you mentioned the preservation database, which is preservationdatabase.org. Check that out. Wonderful tool. Um, we talked about out of reach. Uh, and so if you ever go to nlihc.org and then slash OOR for out of reach, there's a really wonderful, um, you, you, you can get state-based reports, but there's also a really wonderful map tool where you can put in your zip code and it'll show you the housing wage for your particular zip code and so forth. Um, but the other tools you'll see are um, the state housing profile and the congressional district profiles. And so if you go to NLIHC.org and you see up at the top it says housing needs by state, um, you click on that and then there will be another piece of the website that if I remember correctly says state-based resources. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's a drop-down menu and you click on your state and then I believe it is resources. What? The need by state. That's yes. On the the home page is uh, housing needs by state, and then it's a drop down menu to your state, and then I believe it's a resources tab to mm -hmm. get to these um, yeah. various fact sheets. Yeah. And stuff. yeah um, the moral of the story is once you get to housing needs by state, you should be able to find all of it pretty quickly. Um, and one thing that's also on uh, that page once you get to once you get to housing needs by state is the email and phone number of whichever organizer covers that state. So if there's anything you can't find, always feel free to reach out to us. Yeah. So uh, one other question here, does any of your research show any nexus between the lack of housing um, and burden, uh, housing cost burden and criminal justice reform issues and incarceration issues? There, there's a lot of research on that, and, and it's research that we use to promote policy solutions. It's not research that we've necessarily done, um, but we'll highlight it very, very often. Um, you'll see some of it linked on our website uh, when you get to the criminal justice um, page. Uh, and additionally, um, our research team is each week promoting a new research report in Memo to Members and Partners. So, so there is, um, especially as it relates to homelessness, a lot of data on this. Um, we recently included a uh, graphic for uh, an upcoming in image, or excuse me, an upcoming edition of Tenant Talk that we got from the Prison Policy Initiative. Uh, they do really wonderful uh, research and they have really great infographics that I would encourage you to check out. Um, and then we try to uh, promote and uh, publicize those kinds of uh, research reports as often as we can. Great, thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, I think that uh, concludes our webinar. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Please be in touch as we move forward.